Every great preacher is a faithful preacher of a great Christ. There are no exceptions to this rule. No matter how well a preacher may address and expound other subjects, be it the family, apologetics, current issues, or the like, every great preacher is a faithful preacher of a great Christ. Such a man may lack the charismatic personality and magnetic draw of other gifted preachers. He may lack the intellectual powers and verbal skills of other pastors. He may lack the striking appearance and baritone voice of, of other heralds. But what he is, is a faithful preacher of the Lord Jesus Christ. At the very core of his pulpit ministry, this is what marks and defines his true greatness. He proclaims a great Christ. The Apostle Paul said, we preach Christ and Him crucified. And yet more succinctly, he said, we proclaim Him. In this conference, we want to talk about preaching Him. We want to talk about preaching Christ and, and Him crucified, and we want to talk about preaching the Son of God, the Savior of sinners, the Sovereign over heaven and earth, the one who is prophet, priest, and king in the Old Testament, a laying open before us in this vast territory of the Old Testament. Our 39 books... 929 chapters, written over a period of 1,000 years, 23,214 verses, 592,439 words, and more than 2,700,000 letters. It is a vast frontier of truth. But beginning in the opening chapters of of Genesis. In fact, the very first verse of the entire Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We know from John chapter 1 that all that there is has been made by the eternal Word. We know from Colossians that by Him and through Him all things have come into being. And from Hebrews chapter 1, he is the one who has spoken everything into being. You cannot even open your Bible and begin to read the beginning of the Old Testament without in the first verse of the first chapter of the first book, there is Jesus Christ standing triumphantly as the creator of all that there is and the sovereign sustainer and director of all that he has made. And as we continue through the pages of the Old Testament, and we come to Genesis 3 and verse 15, the proto-euangelion, uh, the first mention of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that this one who would be of the seed of the woman would come and crush the head of the serpent and the very opening uh, chapters here, a declaration of the salvation that would come through the Lord Jesus Christ. And on and on it goes throughout the Old Testament. Uh, the creation of the entire sacrificial system, uh, picturing and foreshadowing the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, that not only is He the picture uh, or the fulfillment of the tabernacle, as He has come and tabernacled among us, John 1.14, but that he also is our great high priest who alone can represent his people before Almighty God in heaven. He makes perfect intercession for us and has offered up the one true sacrifice on our behalf as he gave himself upon the altar of Calvary's cross and made the perfect atonement for our sins." Throughout the book of Genesis, we see Christophanies as Christ appears as the angel of the Lord, as He appears in chapter after chapter after chapter, as the messenger sent from heaven to, to men here upon the earth 
in a pre-incarnate appearance as he is recognized and addressed as God by those who stood before him. And more than 100 prophecies of the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to say nothing of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We come to the book of Proverbs. Uh, The wisdom of God revealed is in reality the wisdom of the Lord Jesus Christ of whom Colossians says, all of the treasures of wisdom and, and knowledge are found in the Lord Jesus Christ. And on it goes as we come to the major prophet of the major prophets, Isaiah, as we read that he would be born of a, of a virgin, uh, that he was, would be a, from the shoot uh, and the offspring of, of Jesse, that he would be filled with the Spirit, that the, as we come to the servant songs in the latter half of Isaiah, that he would be the one sent by God as a light to the nations, a covenant for the people, and that he would be the suffering servant of Jehovah who would bear the sins of his people and save them from their sins. A time does not permit us to find the Lord Jesus Christ in so many places in the Old Testament. And so we would have to leave that for an extended uh, semester in a seminary classroom that would take in reality more than a semester. It it would take multiple semesters to dive into every nook and, and cranny of the Old Testament Uh, to find the glories that are shining of the Lord Jesus Christ. It has been well said that the Old Testament is a hymn book. It is all about Him, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, It is said that there are 39 mountain peaks rising out of the soil of the Old Testament, and each and every one of them is pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ Himself, bearing testimony that he is coming. In the Gospels, it says he is here. In the book of Acts, they declare his coming. In the epistles, they explain his coming. And in Revelation, it says he is coming again. But what a sturdy base and sturdy foundation we have to uh, the pyramid of the Bible. What a sturdy base in these 39 books in which they all testify that this one is coming, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, with that by way of introduction, I want us to look now at this one selected passage, Psalm 2. And for us to to work our way through this psalm, and for us to, to, to see the Son, the anointed of the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, I want to break this psalm out into four headings, and perhaps your Bible will even uh, put some space between certain verses to show the four stanzas of three verses each. That's the overview uh, of this psalm. There are four stanzas of three verses each, and there is a different speaker in each stanza of Psalm Two. And I want to begin, I want you to note first, in the first three verses, the insurrection against God. Uh, as this psalm begins, uh, the psalmist speaks as he describes the entire human race in rebellion against God and against His anointed, who is the Messiah who is later identified as the Son of God. So verse 1 says, Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The psalmist expresses his absolute astonishment and amazement at the cosmic treason that is being launched in an, against God in an attempt to overthrow the eternal government of God. 
Now, this rebellious conspiracy is a worldwide treason. Notice, nations in verse 1, in the plural. There are no nations excluded from, from this statement. And the peoples in the plural. This anarchy involves all nations and all peoples who are outside the kingdom of God. And they are in an uproar. It is not a quiet or subtle resistance. It is a, an uproar in the public places, in the marketplace, in the houses of religion, in the schools of learning. There is anarchy in the streets, and there is a conspiracy as the world binds together in its opposition to God. And the psalmist says at the end of verse 1, it is a vain thing. Oh, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the end of death. It is vain. It is futile. It is, it is senseless. It is madness. It is insanity that this world would conspire together against the reign of Almighty God and against His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We read in verse 2, now, the leaders of these nations, as they will band together, notice the kings of the earth take their stand. They, they set their jaw. They, they drop their anchor. They take their rigid stand against God and against His Son. And the rulers take counsel together. They, they come together as they forge their alliances and, and forge their, their loyalties together against God and against His Son. Uh, the annals of human history are replete with such arrogance among leaders who are anti-God and anti-Christ going all the way back to, to Nimrod, and to Pharaoh, and to Nebuchadnezzar, and to Antiochus Epiphanes, and to all the Caesars, and to count, countless others over these last centuries, this rebellion was supremely demonstrated in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, the trials, the sentences, the execution at the hands of the leaders by the name of Annas and Caiaphas and Pilate and Herod, and ultimately this riotous rebellion against God and His anointed will rise to, its, to a fever pitch in the last days before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ as the kings of this world will take their stand against God in heaven and shake their fist in anger against the government of God. Notice what it says at the end of verse 2. Against the Lord and against His anointed. Now this represents the entire span of human history. From the rebellion in the Garden of Eden all the way down to the last sentence in the last paragraph of the last chapter of, of human history. This cosmic treason and this cosmic rebellion against the Lord and against His anointed. And if we ever needed proof for the doctrine of total depravity and the radical corruption within the hearts of men who are fallen sons of Adam, these opening verses in Psalm 2 proves evidence beyond a shadow of a doubt of the resistance against Almighty God. I hear missionaries sometimes talk about, like, overseas, and, and people are, are, are hungry for God, and people are searching and looking for God. No, they're not. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way. And from the dawn of human history down to the end, it is the nations and the people devising a vain thing in an uproar 
the kings taking their stand and the rulers taking counsel against the Lord and against his anointed. And this rebellion in reality started in the courts of heaven when Lucifer, the son of the morning, rose up against Almighty God in heaven and was so persuasive that he rallied a third of the angels who are standing in the presence of God to come join his anarchy and his rebellion, and he was cast down to the earth. And as he came slithering onto the page of human history, speaking through the serpent, it was an attack against the Lord and against his anointed from day one of human history. And so we look at verse 3 and we hear what they are saying. This is a collective voice, as though all of the voices merging together, rising up in this, in this belligerent tone, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. In other words, we do not want to be tied down with the moral restraints of what the Lord and His anointing are saying. Uh, we do not want to adhere to their plan for the family. We do not want to adhere to their plan of salvation. And they are seen as tearing their fetters apart and trying to throw off every restraint that God would place upon them, even by His moral law. Beloved, this is human history in a nutshell. This is the generation that crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the world seen in the last days upon the earth. This is the effect of total depravity over the whole world. And as we go forth and preach the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we cannot be naive. Uh, we must be mindful that we are bringing the glorious news of Jesus Christ to people who are in rebellion against Almighty God and against His Son. And it is only by the power of the Holy Spirit and by the sovereignty of this Son who has said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. It is only by the efficacy of their work are we able to move forward in the face of such resistance. That is the insurrection against God. And we cannot have a Pollyanna view of the world around us as we preach Christ and Him crucified. Now second, I want you to see the indignation of God because this rebellion does not fall upon deaf ears in heaven. The one who sees all and knows all now speaks for the first time in this psalm. The Lord of glory is not indifferent to such cosmic treason. And we read in verse 4, He, referring to the Lord, this would be the first person of the Godhead, God the Father, He who sits. Please note that He sits. That is to say He is enthroned upon high. He is ruling over all and reigning above. He is sitting upon His throne of sovereignty. He has established His sovereignty in the heavens, and it rules over all. He is presiding over world affairs, and as R.C. Sproul says, there is not one maverick molecule in the entire universe. He who sits in the heavens, laughs. It is not the laughter of hilarity. It is not the laughter of joviality. It is the laughter 
of derision and mockery. As God responds at the insanity of puny little man, dust of the earth, rising up against the creator of heaven and earth and all that there is. He who sits in the heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He taunts them. He ridicules their pygmy effects to resist his sovereignty. Verse 5 then, the divine laughter turns to wrath. Then he will speak to them in his anger. Righteous anger, holy vengeance. This is a long way from smile, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. He will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed... The idea is I have enthroned, I have installed my king, and this is a reference to his anointed in verse 2, and his son in the next stanza, and in the last stanza, God says, I have installed my king upon Zion, the the holy mountain. There is an earthly Zion, and there is a heavenly Zion, and this is the Heavenly Zion above, in the heights of the heights of heaven, where God is at the top of the organizational chart of the entire universe, as He sits alone, enthroned with His Son at His right hand. Uh, Turn with me, if you would, over to Psalm 5 while we're here in the opening um, Psalms. In Psalm 5, verse 4, The psalmist David writes, For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. You destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. Come to Psalm 7 and verse 11, and we want to see the holy response of God to the insurrection of man that rises up against him. And in verse 11 of Psalm 7, we read, God is a righteous judge and a God who has indignation every day. If a man does not repent, he will sharpen his sword. He has bent his bow and made it ready. And Spurgeon says, in treasury of David, and when God bends his bow and puts the arrow in, God never misses the target. Verse 13, he has also prepared for himself deadly weapons. He makes his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, he travails with wickedness, etc., Look at, chap, look at Psalm 9 in verse 7 and 8. But the Lord abides forever. He has established His throne for judgment. For He will judge the world in righteousness. He will execute judgment for the peoples with equity. Verse 15. The nations have sunk down in the pit which they have made. In the net which they, which they hid their own foot has been caught. And then verse 19, arise, O Lord, do not let man prevail. Let the nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, O Lord. Let the nations know that they are but men. And then Psalm 11 and verse 4, the Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord's throne is, is in heaven. 
His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous and the wicked, and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. Upon the wicked he will rain snares, fire and brimstone, and burning wind will be the portion of their cup. This is the indignation of God, psalm after psalm, verse after verse of God's indignation against the insurrection of the moral and spiritual insanity of this world. I want you to note now in the third stanza the intention of God. Come back if you would to Psalm 2 as we look at now at 7 verses 7 through 9. The speaker now changes from God the Father and now His anointed, the one whom the Father says is my King, who I have installed, this one who will be identified as the Son of God. In verse 7, now, this anointed of the Lord speaks. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. This decree of the Lord is the eternal purpose and plan of God established from before the foundation of the world, decreed by God in eternity past, that His own Son will reign in glory, that there will be a bride for His Son, the elect of God, the chosen ones given to the Son, who will become a part of this worshiping throng around His throne above. But there are no evil forces upon this earth or in hell itself that will be able to thwart the ongoing purposes of Almighty God upon the earth. As Martin Luther said, the devil is God's devil for God to use for His own purposes. And so the anointed says, I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. It was only the Son who was there with the Spirit to have even heard this decree in eternity past. He said to me, the Father said to the Son. This is an inter-Trinitarian conversation that we would not know of except now the Son discloses to us what the Father said to Him in secret. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. This begotting by the Father of the Son does not refer to the Father creating the Son, as the cults would say. When we come to Hebrews chapter 1, it is very clear that it speaks to the time of the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ as He was begotten of a virgin in the womb of a, of a virgin sired by the Holy Spirit of God, Luke 1, 35. And in Acts 13, we read that this day of the Lord being begotten goes on to refer to the day of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ when He was raised from the dead and came walking out of that tomb, a risen, living, victorious Savior with the keys of death and Hades in His hand. Yes, it was on that day, Acts 13 tells us, that He was begotten as He triumphed over death and the grave itself. And here's what the Father says to the Son in verse 8, Ask of me. The Son is relaying now what the Father has said to Him. Ask of me, and I, referring to the Father, will surely give the nations as your inheritance. These nations that are in rebellion. These nations that are in revolt. These nations that have risen up and conspired together to try to overthrow the moral, the moral fabric and fiber of God. And the very ends of the earth as your possession. The Son will possess the nations to do with them as He pleases. 
Now note what the Son, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, will do with the riotous nations that are put into His hands by God the Father. The next verse, verse 9, the Father now says this to the Son. The Son is an, the, the son is an obedient Son who always does the will of the Father. And the Father has entrusted all judgment to the Son. This is what the Father says to the Son. You shall break them. The them referring to the nations that are in unbelief against God. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthen vessels. I've been in places, missions conferences, where the church will put up a big banner, and it will say that the Lord Jesus Christ will inherit the nations. In this context, this inheritance is to smash the nations as they will perish as they have raised up against the moral law of Almighty God. Here we see very clearly that God has a Son. He is the Son of God, the Son of Man, co-equal and co-eternal with God the Father. He assumes the role of the Son within the Godhead as an equal, that He would be in submission to the headship of the Father and be in obedience to the eternal plan and purposes of the Father, yet as one who is co-equal and co-eternal with God the Father. And these verses anticipate the great white throne judgment at the end of time. In Revelation 20 and verse 11, the Apostle John writes, And I saw a great white throne throne. Great speaks of its power. White speaks of its purity. Throne speaks of its presiding. And him who sat upon it, that is this son, the Lord Jesus Christ, my king, God says, who is installed. And him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And John writes, and I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. So much sin, so much judgment, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. This is the intention of God, that His Son will have the last word and the last say over every life, over every soul, and that everyone will stand before the Lord, and every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, this is the intention of, the, of God, that He has highly exalted His Son and given Him a name which is above every name. And there will be no, there will be no resisting this intention of God. This now leads to the final stanza. 
In verses 10 through 12, we see the grace of God. We see the mercy of God as an invitation is extended to those who are a part of this global, worldwide conspiracy against God. And the speaker yet changes again. The psalmist now speaks on behalf of God. He becomes the mouthpiece by which the invitation from the throne of God is extended. Notice verse 10. Now therefore, meaning in light of what has just been said, now therefore, O king, show discernment. O kings, wake up, wise up. Show discernment. Pull out of the irrational, illogical stance that you have taken against Almighty God and against His Son. And then he says, take warning, O judges of the earth. It is not an idle threat. The judges will be judged in the last day. If they do not respond to the Son, verse 11, worship the Lord with reverence. Come and fear God. Kneel in awe before Him. Take God seriously. Hear the word of the Lord. The unbelieving world must realign itself and humble itself under the mighty hand of God. He says, and rejoice with trembling. God is your biggest and greatest hope, and God is your biggest and greatest threat. So now finally, verse 12, this gracious invitation. Everything that has preceded has been like the black velvet backdrop upon which the glory of this invitation to come to the Son and receive mercy, undeserved forgiveness. This invitation now shines brighter than 10,000 suns in the sky above in face of the darkness of all that has preceded. So verse 12, do homage to the Son. Oh, come to the Son. King James says, kiss the Son. Oh, come to the Son. Throw yourself upon His mercy. Come while there's time. Come while the, day, the door is open. Come while God is calling. Come and do homage to the Son. Show affection to the Son. The one who loves the Son, the Father will love. But the one who rejects the Son, the Father will reject. Every man's eternal destiny hinges upon what will they do with Jesus Christ. And if they will receive Christ as their Lord and Savior, the Father will receive them with arms of mercy. But if they continue to harden their hearts against the Son, the Father will reject them and cast them down and they will perish forever. Do homage to the Son that He may, that He not become angry and you perish in the way. To perish here means to be cast down into the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. In Psalm 1, in verse 6, at the end, it says, The way of the wicked will perish, to suffer eternal destruction, always dying, yet never dying, suffering the torment of the damned. This gracious invitation, turn to the Son. Look to the Son. Cast yourself upon the Son, him who comes to the Son, He will in no wise cast out. He says, for His wrath may soon be kindled. 
that is smoldering, but it will soon be kindled in that last day as the books are open and he renders the final sentence. The psalm concludes, How blessed are all who take refuge in Him. The hymn refers to the Son. Him refers to the anointed, the one whom God calls my King. It is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ Himself, the one who is the only Savior of sinners upon Calvary's cross. And as we shall look at tomorrow, the one who hung upon that cross, suffering under the wrath of His own Father, so that there would be no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Would you notice how Psalm 1 begins in verse 1 and how Psalm 2 concludes in verse 12? This is a literary device known as inclusion, or as some would call it, inclusio. It's like brackets around the first and the second psalm to show that they stand together and they speak evangelistically. Notice Psalm 1, verse 1, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Psalm 2 concludes, how blessed are all who take refuge in him. These First two psalms are like two gatekeepers as all who enter into the temple of the Psalter must hear their witness. In Psalm 1, there are two roads of life. There is the way of the righteous and there is the way of the wicked and there is no other way. And Psalm 2 now stands next to Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 is saying, if you continue down the way of the wicked, you will surely perish and you will kindle the wrath of the Son. But if you will come to the Son and if you will do homage to the Son and if you will show affection and saving faith and cast yourself upon the Son, you will find refuge in the Son. Refuge from what? Refuge from the wrath of God Himself. R.C. Sproul has written a book, Saved from What? When he was a college student, he was walking across campus, he was newly converted, and a very rabid, evangelistic-like student came up to him and said, Brother, are you saved? Dr. Sproul said it scared him to death. He ran back to his dorm room and shut the door and sat in his dorm room and thought about that question, are you saved? And he said, I began to think, saved from what? He said, then he realized to be saved from God himself. And only God can save from God. And only the mercy and the forgiveness of God the Father that is demonstrated in God the Son and offered to sinners freely without cost, only that mercy and grace can save from the wrath and the fury and the vengeance of Almighty God throughout the ages to come. This is why we must preach Christ. For there is salvation in no other name. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. This is why we must preach Christ. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all, the testimony born at the proper time. This is why we must preach Christ from the Old Testament, from the New Testament. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. As we preach Christ, God by his sovereign mercy and by his sovereign grace calls and draws and regenerates and burst into his kingdom those who have been appointed for his son to be his bride. 
our responsibility is to declare the glory and the mercy of the Son, as well as to warn of the wrath to come. It is God's responsibility and duty to save those whom He will save. How God loves to bless the preaching of His Son from the Word, and especially His Son whom He has installed upon His holy hill, Zion. Let us lift high His name. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank You for such a glorious Son that You have sent into this world, Your only begotten Son, that He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of a virgin, born under the law, born in the fullness of time, who lived a sinless and perfect life, fulfilling all the requirements of the law, offering now a perfect righteousness to lawbreakers such as we are. How we praise you that you appointed your Son to go to the cross, there to die for us, bearing the sins of His people. And after He was taken down and buried and raised and ascended, You have installed Him at Your right hand. Now we praise You that we have such a glorious Son, the Son of God, to proclaim to sinners who are under Your wrath, but that they might find forgiveness and mercy and refuge in His glorious work of grace upon the cross. Strengthen us in our resolve to preach Christ even from the Old Testament. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.